Adam, this PSA four that I have here, look at this. The centering is dead on. The registration is 98%. It's just got some corner, slight corner rounding. To me, this is superior to an off-centered seven. To me, this is superior to an eight with perfect centering, but but it's completely blurry because and the oil drop is like way down low and the word oilers is is down much lower than on this copy. I'd much rather have an in focus centered copy in a in a PSA four slab versus you know a card that might have perfect corners and perfect edges and might be slightly off centered with and being out of focus. To me, registration is a is an element of surface grade subgrade to, to me at least i don't know if that's how psa does it but that's how i would do it and i think it's also a an underappreciated element of a card today i'm excited to welcome my good friend jeremy lee to episode number two jeremy is uh, as a lot of you know the, the host of uh, sports cards live and uh, and somebody who I think of as a real expert on the Wayne Gretzky rookies, the tops and the OPG cards. Uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here so early in the uh, in the run of this uh, particular program. So thanks for having me. Well, you were one of the first people who we thought of because uh, I know of your passion for these cards. I, I wondered if you could start by uh, giving us sort of a, a history of, of this card and maybe talk to why it is as popular and as significant of a card as it is. Well, first of all, it comes down to Wayne Gretzky. He's obviously, I believe, an all-time GOAT spanning all sports. He's somebody who is, it's really indisputable. And now some people will dispute it. Some people will say that Bobby Orr was a better player or Mario Lemieux was a bigger player. Those are the two players that do enter the conversation. But when you just look at the record books, there's no doubt in my mind that Wayne Gretzky is the greatest hockey player of all time. He's a, you know, the card itself is something that if you grew up as a hockey fan, especially if you grew up in Canada as a hockey fan, everybody wanted the Wayne Gretzky rookie card right away. It came out in late 79, early 1980. It was something that everybody wanted. Everybody knew who he was. He was a phenom as a youngster. So there was no surprise that he was going to become the player that he did eventually become. And it's just a card that everybody wanted. And as far as its overall importance, in my opinion, it's a card that it's an iconic card. There's no doubt about it. It's on the Mount Rushmore of hockey cards. It's a card that represents the hockey card niche to the overall hobby. It's a card that if you don't even... No, if you don't follow hockey, if you're not a hockey fan, it's a card that you still are aware of. You probably know what it looks like with that unique blue border. Gretzky is on the ice on an angle on the card. He's leaning over. And it's, you know, to me, it's very similar to the 86 Fleer Michael Jordan and its importance to the overall hobby and the 89 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. Just in terms of how recognizable it is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a card that everybody wants. It's a card that I'm often asked by non-hockey collectors to help them purchase a card. It happens almost weekly. Someone will send me a DM saying, you know, what do you think of this copy or that copy? So it's important. It's recognized by everyone in the hobby is an important card. Do you think it's, is it, is it the number one, uh, most iconic hockey card? Bar none. Awesome. Um, where do you think it fits? This is a hard question. Where do you think it fits in the all-time ranking across all sports, all types of cards? Where would where would you put it in that pantheon? You know, that would require going through all the cards. And there are certainly a, several baseball cards that are going to be in that top 10 list, but um to <laughs> what would you what would you put what would you put ahead of it? I guess is the better question. A 52 tops Mickey Mantle, an 86 Fleer Michael Jordan, only because He's a worldwide entity uh, who transcends sport. Um, so yeah, the mantle, the the Gretzky, the Jordan. I don't know if you would put the Honus Wagner up there. I get, I mean, just because it's such a grail of a card, and there's only sixty something known examples, while there are 
tens of thousands of Gretzky's available or out there. And, you know, on any given day, you can, you can go into online marketplaces or card shows or local card shops and find a thousand to choose from. So it's not a difficult card. So that's why I hesitate to really put the Honus Wagner, but if you're looking at the most important cards of all time, the Honus Wagner T206 is definitely, you know, one, two or three. It's sort of a different discussion though, uh, that I, that I'm kind of getting at here. So you know, it's up there with the Jordan. It's up there with the Ken Griffey Jr. Um, it, it's up there with the Mantle 52 tops. It, it just is because he's the greatest of all time, Wayne Gretzky. There are, there's really no argument there. You put it top five, top five uh, maybe, maybe even just, maybe just outside the top five, but that's, I mean, that, that says a lot about the card. I think one thing that's interesting about it is that for all those other cards, there's really like one version. But as we talk about the Gretzky, we know that there's, you know, there's a tops version and there's an OPG version. I'd like you to maybe, um, you know, talk a little bit about why the OPG is, is viewed as being more popular. And I'd also really like to know, you know, growing up in Canada, did you have access to both of them? And, uh, and why, why are there two different brands? Yeah. So there's two different brands because OPG is, was a, a licensee of, top so opichi had a license to take those images and print the card in canada for canadian distribution so the 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 general thought out there is that there are more tops copies that were produced than opichi simply because they were for us distribution and the united states is 10 times the population of canada pretty much always has been so that's that that kind of makes sense growing up in canada as i did we didn't have the tops copies uh, sold in the local, you know, corner stores. So I would say there wasn't as much access to the tops card as there was the OPG. However, if you lived in in southern Ontario, which was which has you know, uh, like Detroit very close by, more tops copies kind of found their way into Canada. So if you're in southern Ontario, you're gonna there, there's more tops copies there than anywhere else in the the country of of Canada. Um, the tops copy is typically a more well-produced copy quality wise that you don't have the rough cut that you have on the, on the Opeachy copy. Uh, it's also the registration is much more clear, uh, as a general rule than the Opeachy copy. So those are some of the key differences I'd say between the, the tops and the Opeachy. Do you feel like is it more popular? So this is something I've always sort of wondered. Is it more popular? Because the OPG, the OPG is a more popular card, correct? It is. It's, it's more desirable, generally speaking. Yeah. So is it more popular because it was created in Canada where you have a higher um, proportion of people who are real fans of the sport? Or is it more popular because it has condition issues that sort of are, you know, more nuanced? Or is it just that? Um, you know, just that it's a, it's a Canadian thing. I mean, any, any thoughts on that? I think it's more popular because of the general theory in the hobby that it's a rarer card, mm. that there were just fewer produced. So it really just comes down to rarity. It's not a scarce card by any means. There is more than enough supply to satisfy the demand, but it's, but it's still, I think that the general thought is that there's just fewer OPG copies that were produced versus the tops copy. And that's, uh, that's one thing. The other thing I would, I would surmise is that the quality of the, of the production of the OPG was, was inferior to the quality of production of the top. So although there, there are, although there may or may not be more tops copies that were produced, that's just a theory. There were, there's definitely, I would say, fewer high quality Opeachy copies that were produced versus the tops copy. And if you look at the population reports on P PSA and BGS, I think you're going to see a lower rate of high end grades for Opeachy than you will for tops. Hmm. Interesting. And while, while we're, you know, while we're talking about um, some of the history of the card, um, you know, we, we think about these other super iconic cards. And one of the things that um, that we notice about a lot of them is that many of them have counterfeits, right? Especially those that were produced um, later into the eighties and the nineties, the Jordan Fleer rookie kind of comes to mind the, the, you know, some of those types of cards. 
Can you talk about you know some of the history with with counterfeits of the card? Yeah, I mean the Gretzky rookie is probably one of the earliest cards that was counterfeited just because it was such a in demand card. Um, I actually, as somebody who has who owns you know a handful of copies and has bought and sold well over hundred copies in my hobby career, I've accumulated a little collection of counterfeits or reprints just so that I can take them to card shows with me, show them to, to educate people who come by my booth and have them as a reference to when, when a raw copy does come by that I can put it up against it and, and kind of ensure or have something to look at. So I, I pulled them out for the purposes of this of this show. And like right here are four different copies. And I, I actually have, I've put a little sticky on it, this like on the sleeve that says F for fake. So that I'm never going to be confused and anybody who might see them at my booth won't be confused. These all have those little F's on them. And these, this is four different copies. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them actually does say reprint on the back. This one says reprint. You can sort of see there's a stamp right there that says reprint. It's, it's tough to see, but it is there. Um, this copy here is actually really, uh, they really attempted to make this, to age it, you can see they aged the back of the of the cardstock to make it look as if it was real, but it's easy to tell that it isn't. So, I think you know one of the one of the reasons I have these, and I think it's a I, I'm glad you asked the question, is because it's important for somebody who's looking to add a Gretzky rookie to their to their collection to. You know, if you're going to buy a raw copy, you need to know what you're looking at because there are several counterfeits out there. It, I recommend buying a graded copy in a, in a PSA or a BGS holder or an SGC for that matter, or CSG, um, and to buy from a reputable seller like PWCC or somebody else that you trust. Have you seen many copies that you, you think might be um, not, not uh, original end up in, in, great, in, uh, in slabs, or is that not something that we see a lot of? I'm sure it's happened, but I can't think of any instances. It's one of those cards that all the grading companies are well aware that there are fakes, and I'm sure they have a, a stack of counterfeits on hand themselves so that they can make sure they're doing their due diligence when they are slabbing a Gretzky rookie. Um, but what you do find, this is interesting, you know, PSA doesn't do this, but, but Beckett under their BVG banner, Beckett Vintage Grading, they will slab copies of the card that were not pack pulled commonly known as sheet cut let's face it all these cards came from sheets originally so the term sheet cut to me is not really an accurate representation of what we're getting at here but we're talking about cards that were not pack pulled cards that were sheet cut but by someone other than an employee of an of opc or tops back at the time these are sheet cut well later um, from a sheet and never inserted in, into a pack so Beckett under the BVG banner will slab sheet cut or non-pack pulled versions of the card, whereas PSA doesn't. For me, my personal taste is I want my cards to be pack pulled. Yeah. So be aware if you're going to look at acquiring one of these cards that if you are like me and you don't want your card to be sheet cut post-production, that you might want to lean towards a PSA slab. Okay, so this is something that's always confused me though, because how can you tell, like how, how could PSA or how could Beckett tell that a card was not pack inserted, but like you say, sheet cut post-production, is that something you could tell with your eyes or how do, how can we expect them to be able to do that? I feel that I can, I'm sure there are some that I, I would miss, but basically, as mentioned earlier, the Opeachy production process uh, was of a lower quality production process than tops. So you're going to often see what is what is commonly referred to as the rough cut on the Opeachy mm -hmm. because the blades just got dull over time. So the earlier copies that were cut will will have a sharper will have sharper edges, whereas the later ones, some of them have a really blatant rough cut on one of the edges or multiple edges. So the first thing you look for in a in an Opeachy copy is that rough cut. And there are different degrees of the rough cut, as I mentioned. However, if you see an Opeachy copy in any slab or raw that has like perfectly cut edges, mm -hmm. 
the antenna go up the you know it's a bit it's a bit of a red flag to say hey was this post production sheet cut or she cut during production, in which case I think you have to pull out a loop and really look at a mag under magnification at the edges to see if they are perfect. If they're perfect, some people might just shy away from it thinking yeah. it's not pack pulled. Other people might say, well, it's an early cut, an early you know copy from the production run. So it's tough. It's some are tougher to say. Last night, I was actually asked about the PSA 9 Opeachy that was sold in the PWCC premier auction by someone who placed, I think, the, the, it was the underbidder in it. He reached out to me earlier that day and I looked at it on, with, you know, PWCC does a great job with those high res scans. And I said, I do not think that is a pack, uh, a sheet cut card. It didn't mm -hmm. look it. It had some, some signs of being an OPG original cut card. So I like, I like this conversation. I, and I, I've never looked at a, a Gretzky in this situation, in this, um, in this way, but I did once submit a card for grading. It was a Jordan rookie and it came back as it showed evidence of trimming. And I thought, how in the world could they tell this, right? It appeared about the same size. And, but so I took it out and I looked at it under a really strong loop. And what was really interesting to me, and I, I just recommend this for anybody who's listening, look at the edge as Jeremy just described on a card and look at all four edges. And if one of those edges is really sharp, and you can, you can see it when you look under magnification. You can see how different the texture of the edge is. That's one of the things that you can look for with, as we talk about post-production sheet cutting. Um, but it is, it's still guesswork. And I think you'll agree with this. It's still guesswork. It's still, you know, you know, it's not always really easy to tell. And people who are counterfeiting um, and people who are cutting, you know, cards post-production, like some of them have gotten really smart. So I... I think there's a certain amount of diligence that we can do. And then there's a certain amount that you realize is kind of imperfect. Is that a fair representation or what do you think? It is. It is. I think, I think you're right. I will, I will throw caution out there that on the, on the Opeachy Gretzky, I find just from experience that the left edge is more commonly rough cut than mm -hmm. any other edge. So if you find a copy with a really rough left edge and a pretty good right edge, that still might be a good copy. It might be. So you really have to look closely at the, you know, if the left it, and it's funny because maybe what they did at the, at the manufacturing facility is the left edge maybe got dull before the right edge did. So they were, they were, they, they replaced it later on or something like that. So uh, I think it's just important to look at the cleanest edge on a copy and look for some some evidence of rough cut even yeah. if it's just a couple of little little dings or little little indents into the into the border itself that's where that's where getting it in hand and getting it under the magnification is so important or like you said under the pwcc the super high um res images you can go in and you can see some of those things so great yeah. great comment that's i think that was great conversation um, but really, I want to get to, I want to make sure we leave time for the, the part of this conversation that's the most interesting to me and that I think you shed such amazing light on, which is the technical components. Um, you know, you've already talked about how the tops card was so much better made, but what I'd love for you to do, Jeremy, is walk us through, um, you know, the technical components from registration and, um, you know, and like you talked about the rough cut. And, and some of those types of things that, that people should look for that to you determine, you know, superior from inferior copies of the card. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a great topic. And when, when we do the, when we cover the premier extended bidding once a month, I often uh, go into some detail here. So I'm, I've got a copy here in my hand. This is a, this is a PSA four from my personal collection. It's a, uh, it, to me, it's, it's a, an amazing four because it's so well centered. So let's start with centering. This card is often off center to find a centered copy is very special. It really is. And you'll, you'll see, if you look at, uh, if you just look at several copies, you'll, you'll understand what, I, what I'm talking about. So centering number one, if you can find a well-centered card, you're you're already ahead of the game. Is is that is that true for both for for both tops and OPG? Or are you talking sp specifically about OPG right now? I'm talking. Thanks for the call out. I'm talking more about OPG. The tops was just a, a was 
a, a higher quality production. So you're going to see fewer off-centered tops copies than you will Opeachy, but they're, they do exist uh, still, but I think at a higher rate in the Opeachy. The next thing is going to be, we've already covered edges, corners or corners. We, there's not much you can say about that. So the final thing, and to me, the most important component of a Gretzky card outside of centering is the registration or the focus of the card itself, the focus of the print quality and how the, how the various printing plates were laid down, where they laid down in, you know, perfectly together. Hey, and Jeremy, Jeremy, let me interrupt you real quick. Let's actually pull up um, a, a Gretzky right now and, and let's look directly at, you know, not just the one that you have in your hand, but let's look at another one and see some of these things that you're, that you're, you're talking about. Well, so I'm, I, I am very picky about my Gretzky rookies, so I don't have any blurry or out of registration copies. So I can't show you one of those, but I'm sure that you can find images in your in the PWCC database because you guys have been through so many. And uh, and so when we talk about registration on a Gretzky rookie, there's a couple places that I look right away. So I'll just I'll just use this copy again as an example. The first thing I look at is where it says Edmonton Oilers. That, you know, here's the black plate and there's the magenta plate and the yellow. They're both in there. So you look to see if they're on the same plane. If the word Oilers is any lower or higher on within that within that white banner, then you have a bit of a registration issue. It's not or, or like less than perfect registration. This copy itself, the oil, the word Oilers, I would say is a hair lower than the word Edmonton. So it, it will be not perfect. The next place I go, and this is where everybody goes, is to this little oil drop within the Oilers logo in the bottom left corner of the card. If that oil drop is not perfectly centered within its pocket, and the pocket being there's a blue outline around it, then again, you have a registration issue. In this case, it's a little bit low, just like the word Oilers is a little bit low because the same printing plates are used, being the magenta and the yellow for that particular one for that particular uh, detail on the card. The other thing, and this is this might be the most important to me because I notice it so much, you'll see on the card, especially you can see in, in the Oilers logo, all these black circles. You see there's one, two, three, four, and a fifth, five and six, right as you get into the image of, of Wayne and the hockey stick there. Oftentimes, the, there is white, that you can see white between the black border and the blue, which is, you know, kind of, it's funny, the, it's a blue bordered card, but then you've got the blue coming around here as well. This copy the, and the PSA 9 that sold last night in the premier auction had no white space between the black. And you can also come up the edge here and see if there's any white between the blue and the black. There's a thin black line on the outside of that white banner. And if there's any white between the black border and the blue, to me, that's a flaw. And I don't, I don't like that detail when it, when it exists. What percentage is, I know you've looked at literally hundreds of these cards. What percentage do you think the the registration specifically with regard to those lines that you're talking about, what percentage of those are, are, are on versus off? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, like i I'm looking at three that I have in my personal collection here. And because I'm so picky when it comes to registration, none of these three have that issue present. But on one of them, I you know the the oil drop is slightly off centered. So I the percentage overall, I don't know if it's I think it's under fifty percent where okay. that where that does exist. But the oil drop, the centering of the oil drop, and the word Oilers versus the word Edmonton is more often um, uh, a present flaw. One other thing to look at when it comes to registration and that many people look at are is the clarity of, of his legs. So it's kind of funny to say, but if you look at the legs and you can often see some blurriness on the outer edge of, of his lower leg here, you also wanna look at his face and make sure that it's, that it's not out of focus. So, for me, at least, uh, this is what I look at when it comes to looking for uh, adding a Gretzky card to my to my collection. Okay, so so um, question time then. Let's pretend that you have a chance at a seven Gretzky with perfect registration, or an eight PSA eight where the registration is off. You get the little bit of white between the blue and the black. 
which one would you choose? Well, I, I would want to understand the centering of these two copies as well. Okay. But I will always choose a better, a, a, a more well focused card, better registration over non registration or, or lack of registration, I should say. Right. Regardless of grade and all that other stuff, you would go. Oh, with yeah. Like, Adam, this PSA four that I have here, look at this. The centering is dead on. The registration is 98%. It's just got some corner, slight corner rounding. To me, this is superior to an off centered seven. To me, this it. is superior to an eight with perfect centering, but but it's completely blurry because and the oil drop is like way down low and the word oilers is is down much lower than on this copy i'd much rather have an in focus centered copy in a in a psa4 slab versus you know a card that might have perfect corners and perfect edges and might be slightly off centered with and being out of focus to me registration is a is an element of surface grade subgrade to, to me at least i don't know if that's how psa does it but that's how i would do it and i think it's also a an underappreciated element of a card being the focus and the registration it's a big problem with the 57 tops bill russell the 50 i think it's the 58 tops uh 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 what's his name the football player jim brown and of course the 48 leaf jackie robinson these cards are always or not always but very often out of focus and to me I will take an off-centered focused card over a centered out of focus card. I love it. You know, the last couple of years, we've seen a shift from just straight up grade to, you know, buy the card, not the grade. And that, that owning, to me, that's what collecting is all about. It's about owning the parts of the card that are most important to you. And, and I like that we live in a world now where somebody can put their hand in the ear and say, I would rather own a four if these components are spot on, then a seven if they're not. And that's why I asked you the question. So fantastic. All right. So I've also heard you talk about the idea of a first print and a second print um, you know, within, within the OPG rookie cards. Tell me what, what that's all about and what you make of it. Yeah. So there is a long standing, I'm going to refer to it as an old wives tale. Um, and I call it the, fir the first print fallacy. There's this law, there's this generally accepted theory in the hobby that there is a first print for OPG in a second and, and a later print or later prints. And the way to identify this is by looking at the back of the card. That's really the only place you can you can see it. And it's it's sometimes it's easier to see, sometimes it's harder to see, but I'll show you where it exists. So here's the back of the card. And right under this little caricature you can sometimes see these two very thin blue lines that are parallel to each other, less than a millimeter apart. And you'll see them from the border of the card right until you get to the edge of the this, this skate here. And then you'll also see them right over here above my finger. So it's some sort of, you know, there might've been a little piece of particle in the printing press and somehow they got, they, they made their way into the card and into the print, into the printing. Now, if these little blue lines are present, this, this copy does have it. You can sort of see it right there. You see those two thin blue lines. They, they, they touch the puck there right above my finger. When they are present, a lot of people consider that to be first print. And you'll see sellers that will put a little sticker on the card and say first print. I don't believe that to be true. I've had extensive discussions um, with Bobby Burrell, who is a, a, a hockey historian uh, who lives where the Opeachy plant was. He doesn't believe it to be true. Um, it makes more sense to me that it's a later print because that's when, you know, <laughs> things might have made their way into, into the printing press. So, but people seem to consider it that way. When I have a copy, because some people want that on their card, even though to me it's a printing defect, some people want it. So I will take a little sticker if I have a copy for sale, I'll put it and I'll just say blue lines present. I'm not going to tell you it's a first print or a non first print, but I will tell you if they are there because some people want them. So that's what that's this sort of first print fallacy that uh, that I ref, that I, I I've called it that and um, and I think that addresses what you're asking. So one of the things that, um, that I've heard a lot of people say is that the tops version and the OPT are just basically identical. If I have the two in hand right in front of me, what's a quick way that I can differentiate between the two? 
So, I mean, outside of what we already talked about being the production quality or, or the lack of quality, the Opeachy, generally speaking, versus the tops, there are a few uh, things that you can look at on the front of the card and the back of the card. The front of the card, and I'm, I'm going to show you one of each. I have them right here. Uh, but the front of the card on the tops, the blue itself, the blue border, and this is the tops copy right here. The blue is just a little bolder than, than the Opeachy copy. Outside of that, it's not that easy to tell because as you can see, it's, it's the same image. But where you can easily tell the difference is on the back because they used a different card stock. And that's just that's just the fact of the matter. So right there, you can right away tell. Again, this is the tops here. It's got a kind of a duller, less bright card stock versus the Opeachy over here. And what you're looking at is actually outside of the outside of the blue and the the brown on the, the outline of the skate on both copies, this is really raw cardstock up there and up there. So that's the easiest way to tell. And this is a true for all years of Tops and Opeachy. The Tops is always a, what I just call a duller looking backside. Mm. Is it more grainy as well? Is it a darker, more grainy background or is it just darker? It's, it's just a darker cardstock that was used. Um, if you look under magnification, though, because it is raw cardstock, you can you can see the you can see fibers of the paper itself. It's funny. I didn't even notice the skate. I've looked at the back of the card a hundred times. I never even noticed it was a skate till you mentioned that. That's so it's funny. A, yeah, yeah, they did a nice job. It was really uh, creative. And then I like how they put you know they they put his name in the bottom of the blade and then in the boot. Is where you have all the stats and the the and the vitals and that. Do people view the 1979 set as like a great hockey set, other than Gretzky, or or not? That's a great question. The answer is no. I mean, if it wasn't for the Gretzky card being in that set, which is 396 cards in the Opeachy version, I believe the tops is 264. Outside of the Gretzky card, there aren't really any wonderful cards there's there are a couple other rookie cards you've got charlie simmer you've got bobby smith um but it's really not uh, a great set for rookies outside of the gretzky and even past that there are two cards that are decent it's the final playing days card of both gordy howe and bobby hall so those are decent but they're still not the the greatest of cards so the set itself is much loved because it's got the Gretzky rookie in it because it's so unique with the blue borders. Um, but outside of the Gretzky rookie card, there aren't many other cards that uh, that that are worthy of, of a of a of a of a collection. I mean, that's 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 harsh to say. Personally, I have the Gordy Howe card. It's his final card and in high grade, and I love it. But outside of the that and the Gretzky, um, there's not much else there to pick from. Are there collectors like with? With the 8680 Flare set, there are collectors who try to put together high grade sets. My guess is that being as large as it is and as condition sensitive it is, there's probably not people out there putting together PSA 9 and PSA 10 uh, sets of this of the set, is there? I mean, there's only two PSA 10 Opichis and two PSA 10 Tops copies on the planet. So okay. maybe two people could do that. Um, you're right. It's it's a it's a big set. 396 cards in the Opichi, where 390 of them are absolute commons. Mm. Uh, but you know, oh, if yeah. you look at the PSA set registry, I'm sure there are people competing for that set. And uh, and to me, it's really a lot of um, just a lot of dead weight. So it's not something that I would advise anybody to pursue. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Your perspective on this is is invaluable. I've learned a ton today about the, the Gretzky rookies. Um, I really just want to thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with us. And, um, you know, before we go, will you leave the viewers with um, anything that you want to shout out? Um, well, Hey, please. If you, uh, if you want to check out my show Saturday night sports cards live, I'd be happy to, to build my audience through, through this uh, platform here. I thank you for having me. And, um, you know, as always, uh, I, you know, I could talk about the Gretzky rookie for hours on end. It's a very important card. It's a card that I think everybody should have a copy of, just like the Michael Jordan 86 Fleer is a very important and accessible card. So I'll leave you with that. Awesome, Jeremy. Thank you again for your time. It was a lot of Thanks. fun. Thank you.